So I've been trying to push my English teachers towards alternative media since I was in 9th grade and started watching anime. And well, trying to get others to play Persona is an Illuminati underscore gaming trademark if you didn't know. And the other day, someone asked me to explain Persona to an English teacher. So why not? I'm going to deconstruct it in as much of a literary manner as I can, starting with of course the overall themes because I know analysts love those. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Humanity is always faced with choices. Toast or chapati, chalky milk or crispy water, Delhi or death. The points take hold in your mind. You weigh the pros and cons. They may be equal, they may not be. One may be the will of the masses like Delhi, one may be objectively ri- like death. One may be morally right like water, but one may be more self-satisfying like milk. People choose. Some choose right, some choose left. Some choose up, some choose down. Some choose to indulge themselves. Some choose to keep integrity. It is the heart of this conflict that Persona tackles. Pitting man versus man, desire versus desire, need versus need. From the very beginning where the biblical figure of Philemon competes in a bet versus the Lovecraftian Nyala Nyala Thotep, testing the potential of humanity to flourish or fall. To the newest game where the desire to be controlled is pit against the love of true freedom, Persona tests humanity. Whether they succeed or fail is up to you, the player. Reflected, of course, by the multiple endings, often varying degrees of morally and objectively good. You can save the world from mental vegetation or protect a serial killer by letting your sister die. You choose. This theme is supplemented by the other main theme of the game, which is that humans have limitless potential, stopped only by their willpower. As the game itself has incredibly heavy psychological origins, with even the term persona itself stemming from Jungian psychology, which I'll get into later, it only makes sense that the limitlessness of the human mind and social relationships takes a front seat in every game. In the modern trilogy, directed by Katsura Hashino, the general final moment is always some form of epic, all-powerful move being cast to defeat a deity that directly opposes the will of the protagonist, spurred on by the power of bonds, willpower, or the will of the masses. The reason I only bring up the Hashino trilogy is because I have no idea about the original 1 and 2 duology, other than the fact that Hitler shows up in Persona 2. Anyway, I think you get the gist of it by now. Humanity is limitless and the only thing holding it back is itself. The themes of course create great inspirational effect and it's one of the reasons the series is loved so much. People claim that playing a single persona game is enough to change entire life philosophies and yes, I am people here. Besides these, there is also a meta-narrative about free will and fate. Oh wow, so many primary narratives. But the meta-element stems from the fact that this is a game and while you, the player, have free will, the question is about the main character. In Persona 3, for example, your fate is sealed from the first night. In Persona 4, your Persona is an Agi, dictates the overall story beat of the game. Moreover, the Hashino trilogy all have the player character as a sort of chosen one, known as a wild card, by the corporeal attendants that help you out. On the topic of cards, did I mention the strong connection these games have to the tarot? To directly quote several lines from Road Less Taken, the opening to Persona Q2, a spin-off title. When looked at in the game design sense, there is a rather large degree of freedom granted in the optional side stories and the playstyle you can pursue, ensuring that no two players play the game the same way. However, challenging this notion is the game design itself. Some dialogue choices are better for progression than others, and some are more consistent with characterization of the main character than others. Fate takes hold here as a challenge to the player. Will they be guided down the path of picking what the character would do, or do they impose themselves onto the main character? Both are valid, both are entertaining, but unfortunately only one gives you a deeper insight into the game. Persona main characters, while while impressionable, still retain a self-identity. After all, you are playing a role-playing game. It is on the topic of these main characters that I want to do a little character analysis now. Every main character is a blank slate. Almost. While you can choose the path they take in the overall story, 
The dialogue options prepared for you are all somewhat consistent with the general characterization. The main character is kind and helpful but not immune to an occasional shot at someone else. Of course, being the main character comes with the obvious side effect of having everyone like you and rely on you. Rather unrealistic, but it makes sense in the overall way that things are. This, however, allows for very easy dichotomies. For example, in Persona 4, where you and the main human villain have the same foundation, but the actual effort taken by the protagonist to socialize and make friends contrasts with the antagonist's social reclusivity. And while you pursue the path of truth, he falls to the darkness as a result of said reclusivity. There's also a grander mythological background, but I'll get back to that. As to side characters, well, there's so many I can't possibly write a paragraph on each of them. Over 60 across the Hashino trilogy and even more if you count the original games. Just know that every character and their character arc embodies an arcana of the tarot, including the positive and negative traits, or both polarities as tarot readers call them. My favourite example and the easiest to understand is Yosuke Hanamura, your first friend in Persona 4 and the magician arcana. Embodying the traits of a trickster while staying logical and collected, he maintains his arcana. It represents his willpower and determination to solve the mystery of the game. He is, after all, the one who suggested creation of the investigation team. In the reverse polarity, it shows the negative sides of his personality. He does, after all, have a rather teenage lecture motivation in quite a few parts of the game, being deceptive, tricky and very sussy. Also, him being the first friend makes sense. The Magician card is marked 1 in a tarot deck where you, the player, are the full arcana or zero. Basically, the characterization of most characters links up with either their persona, arcana or both. So to cover the tarot broadly, which the persona games aim to do as well, you, the player, are the zeroth card, the full arcana. And just as the tarot is the fool's journey, so is this game your journey. It begins with an introduction to the world and, according to the High Priestess card, the material unconscious, where all creative events happen. This checks out with the psychological themes of a collective unconscious being where the will of humanity happens. If you're confused, it'll make sense when I cover Jungian psychology. Anyway, the fool slowly progresses through the tarot deck, slowly learning about the ways of the world, until the first major obstacle, the need to look inwards. This is generally represented by the actual awakening of your persona or your mind's superpowers. The Hermit Arcana represents this phase, where the fool looks inwards and introspects to learn about themselves, as the past 8 cards have been spent learning about the world. This leads directly to the Wheel of Fortune card, where the fool starts to take action in the world. Then, the Justice Arcana, where the fool decides to push on after the first major challenge. Then Death, card 13, a shedding of the old ways and a refreshing of the new. Challenge after challenge, arcana after arcana, the fool pushes on until the turning point of the game, where the fool arcana social link, that being the relationship represented by the fool card, generally starts to embody judgment, where the truth is found and the new true objective is revealed, be that saving the world, saving the world, or saving the world. Saving the world, you say? Makes sense. The final card is the world arcana. The fool completes his journey. What's my point? Throughout, different stages in the game and the character arcs represent these different cards in the fool's journey. Starting a fool, blind, oblivious, and ending as a master of the world, Persona games carry out the tarot deck, a natural progression of power, maturity, and knowledge that makes them feel incredibly resonant and, well, natural. It makes no sense when you start, and it all makes sense when you finish. You're weak at the start, and you can kill a god by the end. Let's see... Themes, check, structure, card by the tarot. Plot and background? Let's do that now. Psychology time. Carl Jung stated that the ego is the person, the conscious mind, and within the mind are facets of personality, the shadows. When the ego or the conscious claims control of these shadows, these facets become personas, active versions of the self that reflect what lies within. But that's a persona from a Jungian standpoint. What is it in the context of the game? A persona is a superpower born from the will and personality of the user. It manifests as a god, demon, or otherwise legendary figure from myth or history. Of course, when a character overcomes their shadow, their dark thoughts that relate to the core theme of the game, they awaken to their persona. Persona 3 dealing with death, as the cast face the fear of death by shooting themselves in the head to awaken to their personas.
Go on. There. Wait. Persona 4 dealing with truth as the cast face their true selves with their darkest thoughts. The summoning animation also has them destroying a tarot card which is their personality. And Persona 5 dealing with freedom as the cast rip off the mask that society forces them to wear off their face. In all three games, they awaken to their powers by directly opposing the shortcoming in human nature, the shadow in themselves, that pertains to the core theme of the game. Remember how I said Persona was about human versus human, choice versus choice, nature versus nature? The dichotomy of personas, the superpowers, and shadows, the enemies, in itself embodies that core message of the game. With enough willpower, you can overcome the tough choice and choose the one that is better and truer to yourself. Now, personas take the form of legendary figures, you say. Yes, that's because the world where all the crazy stuff happens is in the realm where the public unconscious lies. Imagine a cognitive world where everything, every desire, fear and other thought lies. Your deepest fears manifest as demons or shadows. Your strengths manifest as personas, superpowers. Your walls, insecurities, and worldview manifest as the levels of the game. And yeah, the persona of the party member embodies their own traits as well as the arcana of the party member. But the protagonist is a wild card, right? That means they can choose their persona, pick how they want to be. It's deep in the way that the main character is technically a blank slate for you to project and reflect on, but also that the main character matures and advances with the story, and is able to adapt to every social situation. The personas represent the characters themselves, but when you can choose any persona, you can choose who to be. That's the thing the game tries to explain about the main character and the side characters. So maybe it isn't a chosen one thing, it's a personality thing. The main character has the right personality and traits to be a wildcard. It's a lot and it's very meta, but the gist of it is that the cognitive world and the Jungian psychology reflect the core themes of the game of humanity facing itself and having limitless potential. Because when you understand yourself, you can understand everything else. This persona connection adds another layer to the parallels drawn in the mythological sense. Or in the case of Persona 5, pop culture. Clear analogies are drawn. The Tower of Death, Tartarus, in Persona 3. The protagonist with his base persona, Orpheus. I don't feel like spoiling Persona 4, but once you find out about the protagonist's base persona being Izanagi, the Japanese god of creation, it all makes a lot of sense. And of course, iconic. Beautifully designed and the scariest comeback mechanic in Smash Ultimate, Joker's Arsene is a gentleman thief. Need I say more? Of course, further connections are made as well. Other Greek figures for Persona 3, other Japanese gods all birthed from Izanagi and his wife for Persona 4, as the Persona 4 cast only awakened their personas with the help of the protagonist, and other famous rebels in Persona 5 like Captain Kidd for Yuji Sakamoto. On top of the base personas for the main cast, there are of course ultimate personas, Yukiko Amagi's Amaterasu, the Japanese sun goddess, or Aegis's Athena, the Greek goddess of war. After all, she is a battle machine. Just a nice extra layer. I could also talk about character designs, but I suck at art and I don't feel qualified other than to point out neat symbolisms, like the ugly woman sat atop the schoolgirls in the shadow boss form of Chie Satnaka. And where would a persona analysis be without music? One word, leitmotifs. Every game has a core leitmotif and it may be used in upbeat tunes, serious tunes or outright depression fuel. To highlight the title motif from each Ashino game we have Oh, 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 oh,
Alongside those, several other motifs are also found in the games. The Iwatodai motif is used for a sense of security, and perhaps one of my favorite uses of late motifs ever was one of those use of the main battle theme's chord progression in the final battle orchestral OST. <laughs> They link locations, feelings, concepts, and ideas subliminally. And while this isn't a thing Persona pioneered or perfected, it just makes sense that the sense of connectedness and thoughtfulness that the game really is a game, one whole. And let's not ignore the excellent social commentary, although excellent applies only to the peaks. Off the top of my head, I think of Eri Minami from Persona 4. And here I want to shout out Hiding in Private's Ultimate Persona 4 Analysis for inspiring me to actually talk about the games I love. 
Anyway, Ari Minami is a random woman you meet who falls prey to a cult indoctrination on TV and is a great depiction of spirituality and how those blinded by faith may be unable to well see the world and see themselves living in name alone trusting in the higher power they believe in refusing to take action failing to realize the human potential in the context of persona 4 it's great too because the whole plot thread of misinformation in the cult is over tv is present and the main theme of persona 4 is truth but i don't want to spoil anything and the more i talk the more likely that becomes so i'll stop here go play the games they'll all be on pc xbox and switch within a year anyway But regardless, I hope I hope I've been able to point out some little things in Persona to help improve your understanding of the series as a whole. Get the psychology, myth- mysticism, mythology, social commentary, meta commentary, psychological commentary, banging music, great character designs, and intentional every single little detail. Thanks for watching.